Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to the book of Acts now, Ecclesia, and we're thankful for his works that he's doing. He's doing a work today that runs deep. Still waters run deep at times. He's doing a mighty work in our midst today. We're humbling ourselves before him. And that's the reason right now I'd just like to say a prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you in yes, complete Lord. repentance. We have not preached as we should. We have not prayed as we should. We have not cried out against the enemy as we should in these last days. Father, forgive us and help us to humble ourselves and completely repent and ask for your restoration that we can be restored to do your works in these last days. We come before you today giving praise and giving honor because you're worthy of all this. Your word needs to go forth. Your word is forever truth that is for the world today to live in truth. We thank you, Father, that we can proclaim it and help us to proclaim it according to your word. And we give you praise for this right now. It will be done in your name as we humble ourselves. In your name, Yeshua, we thank you. Amen, amen. Let it go forth. Our pastor, Bishop Jerry Bowers, is coming today with a precious word of Yahweh. So receive today. Humble yourself. Repent and take your place where you need to be in Him in these last days. We pray this in the name of Yahshua. Amen. 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 Thank you, Apostle Homer. Hallelujah. We're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Many things are happening in the world today. And certainly, we are in need of God's intervention. God's hand of intervention. Uh, Father, we just ask that you bless us as we share your word today. We ask that you will illuminate our eyes and send forth this message to those who are watching. We pray, Father, with the unction of your spirit, in Christ's name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Glory. I'm going to go to the book of Daniel to start. Daniel 7. And there's a picture here of the Ancient of Days and judgment being set. And I believe it's pointing to the last days. Amen. Daniel 7, beginning in verse 9, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. His hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands ministered to him. Thousands times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. And then in verse, four, thir verse 13 it says, I was uh, watching in the night vision and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Who would that be? That would be Christ. Yeah, Yeshua. He came to the Ancient of Days to the Father and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory in the kingdom, and all the peoples and nations and languages should serve him. There is a court in heaven, and our courts are set up based on the model of what we see in the Bible. And until 2005, we used to have the Ten Commandments posted in the court. And, uh, of course, that's the basis of law, isn't it? The Ten Commandments. People would like to get get rid of them or say they're just suggestions and forget about it but they're not suggestions they're God's law his commands and um, the court you know there is one who presides over the court and there are jurors uh, if you've ever been called to jury duty you know about that I was called once to jury duty yeah. and uh, great, a great inconvenience but it's a, a part of how our society operates when it comes to justice are they perfect no but I challenge you to find a better system in the world today than what we have. We should be thankful. And so, when it comes to judgment, 
things are going on in the courts of heaven. And you and I are invited to appear before uh, the court of heaven to go there. In fact, it says in, in uh, Hebrews 4.16, Come confidently and boldly before the throne of grace, that you might receive grace and mercy to help in time of need. Amen. So the enemy might be accusing you or me. The enemy might be making a big deal out of something that's happened in your life. You've confessed it. You've surrendered. It's under the blood. Amen. And so when you come before the court and before the Father, He doesn't see you and me in our weakness. You know what He sees? He sees us covered with the life of His Son. And we are received as perfect and complete. That's why we can come confidently and boldly. Because we have a high priest in heaven. Whoever lives to make intercession for us. And invites us to come out to go through no priest or nobody. We get to come confidently and boldly. Because we're a part of the royal priesthood Amen. in the New Testament. We're not under the, the Levitical priesthood. We're under the Melchizedek priesthood. And we have a high priest. And he wasn't even from the Levite line. He's from the line of Judah. Amen. So that's good news, folks. We need some good news to go along with this. But we have the right when we see evil in the world. And we see evil prevailing. We have the right to not only go before uh, God in the court. We have the right to go before the whole court. Amen. Now this is going to boggle somebody's mind. I've already been challenged on this before. But... Uh, believe me, if we had time, we could look at other ver uh, verses in the Bible. There is a court that seats up there. And you have the right to come and, and humble yourself in humility and, and to present your case before the court. Now, I've done that and I've, I've said, Lord, um, I'd like to know if I can have an answer. I did this with the abortion issue. And the elders responded. And they gave me an answer. Now, I can't remember all the details of it. It is typed out. And guys, I will give that to you to declare when you go to, down to, um, uh, to Austin, to the state capitol. But they said, um, we find in the favor of the plaintiff, the children. And they quoted President Trump. He went out on, uh, when they were doing the National Day of Life march one year. And he gave an eloquent talk. And in that talk, he said that those babies are created in the image of God. Amen. And, um, and that they are to be protected. Because they are of not only his image, but of his creation. And, and so they quoted him. Um, and it said, we find in favor of the plaintiff. That, it, that this law that is enthroned by evil should be overturned. So they've already given... Um, their verdict on this. We're just waiting to see it fulfilled and carried out. But we do have the right to do that, beloved. Amen. To exercise who we are. So, uh, I want to take a, little, uh, a look at um, a little bit of our history in America. And I'm going to start by going to Leviticus chapter 25. And uh, when we started out, we had the Declaration of Independence. And Y'all remember that every year on July 4th, people are wondering, where are the fireworks? I want to go see the fireworks. What's well, at the high school or where, you know, some venue that we got in town or um, sometimes they have it out on the lake. You know, if you're in our region, you can go out to Lake Brownwood and see the beautiful fireworks. But all of that is celebrating uh, the liberty that we have as a nation. And so I want to go back to look at the foundation of this. And I'm going to read this text and then explain it. Uh, Leviticus 25.10 says, well, let's start with verse 9. Then you shall cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. And you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all your land. Verse 10. And you shall consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land and to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. For each of you shall return to his possessions. Amen. Now that's restoration. That's restoration of inheritance. So what could happen back then in Israel is that uh, you could, you know, people do that today. You could put a lien on your property. You lose your property and you have to leave your property or you, you become an indentured servant. You have to go serve until you pay off your debt. 
Well, when Jubilee came, that was all canceled. The debts were canceled. Be good if they do that today. <laughs> the debts were canceled and uh, slaves got to be set free and went home. There's this like collective cry that went throughout the land of praise and thanksgiving. That was the great return was taking place. This prefigured repentance that would take place in the last days for the great harvest. A time of return to God. Because that's what repentance is. It's a turnabout, a returning to God. And, uh, and they would celebrate. Now the other side of the coin is, if they didn't observe this and follow what God said to do, then there was a judgment that came instead of the freedom. And so we want to look at this for a reason. When America gave their Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1776, they rang a Liberty Bell. And today the Liberty Bell has a big crack in it. Y'all remember that? Now this thing was huge. If you measure the circumference around that bell, it was 12 feet. 12 is a symbol of government. So they ring that along with other bells. To declare a declaration of independence. If they hadn't have declared the declaration of independence. There would be no United States of America today and no freedom. We have to declare it. And so. We entered into. Now most of us don't understand this. Inscribed on the bell. Was Leviticus 25.10 that I just read. Not in its fullness. But it, what it said on there. Declare liberty throughout all the land. Now, our forefathers had a love for Israel. Did you know that? In fact, uh, two of them um, had uh, drawn up what they wanted to be the seal of America. And on the seal was Moses crossing the Red Sea with the children of Israel to the promised land. Because they felt like this was the promised land. But that seal wasn't adopted, but it shows you their heart, right? So they, they put this on the bell. Now, when they did that and used that as the basis for declaring the Declaration of Independence, they entered our nation into a covenant, a jubilee covenant with God. Amen. So it behooves us to understand what is the jubilee covenant. Because we entered into that as a nation. Every 50th year, debts are to be canceled. Slaves are to be set free. And our Constitution even says that all men are created equal and have the right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. By the way, would that, would that declaration of the covenant include an unborn child? Amen. Absolutely. Because that child is a human being. It has a heartbeat. All right, so here's what happens. Fifty years this is supposed to happen. And along the way, there were new states that were co coming in. And they asked for those states to be excluded from slavery. But Congress denied it. So God gave some extra time because there were some attempts to comply with the Jubilee Covenant. But 70 years later, one generation, 1776 to 1864, 70 years they rang the bell for Washington's birthday on February 23rd, 1864, and it cracked. Do you know why it cracked? God was saying, you broke my covenant. Because the covenant was written on the bell. And when the thing cracked, it was God saying, you broke this thing. And therefore, accountability is coming. It was a warning to repent. They still didn't repent. And so... Fifteen years later comes the Civil War. This was the judgment of God. Now, we know at this time, there were about 600,000 slaves. About close to one quarter of the inhabitants of America at this time are slaves. This isn't just a small description. There were four million people in America. This isn't just a, a small representation of society. Well, you know... <clears throat> there were only a handful of slaves, not that many. No, it's a significant amount of the, of the country were slaves. Amen. And so God was calling upon the church in particular and godly leaders to come back to covenant and honor covenant. 
and they didn't. And so this lasted for four years. Then we go down through time, and there, there are other representations that I could go into of the 50-year cycles, but we're not here to go through all of that. But we come down here to April the 12th, 1970, we had the New York abortion law, the most progressive of all abortion laws. Roe versus Wade didn't take place until 1973. If you go 50 years, God calling upon us as a nation to repent for the shedding of innocent blood of children. If you go 50 years from April, by the way, the Civil War judgment happened on April 12th. Notice the date here for the New York abortion? April 12th. Coincidence, right? Now we go 50 years later to February 2020. Oh, here's February again. Warning. February 2020, COVID deaths. They were announcing that the, the reality of the, of the, um, the COVID-19 First deaths actually started in February. This is a judgment. Make no mistake. And it's going to continue because we haven't had the repentance that God's calling for. And uh, as I said to you last week, there's, there are worse things coming. Now, there's several reasons for this. What, what is judgment, by the way? Is, is God taking the, the, the COVID virus and zapping people and killing them. Is that what's happening? No, that's not God. But God, what God will do, we see this at the cross. He will withdraw himself and his protection. Amen. That's the wrath of God. And so what we see is he withdrew from his son. Who took our sins upon himself. And he withdrew from him. And he cried out. This is what, what actually caused the death of Christ really. Father, why have thou forsaken me? It broke his heart. Why hast thou forsaken me? God, in effect, is saying, America, you've chosen a culture of death. I'm going to withdraw for a bit until you repent. You can have what you chose. That's my judgment. That's what's going on. We serve a God of mercy, and he doesn't want this to happen. But neither does he want to see these precious babies murdered in the womb to the tune of now, I think, 72 million. And so he's withdrawn his hand of protection, asking us to cry out, and to not only cry out in prayer, but to do something. And to have a voice, hold people accountable. The Bible talks to us about not enthroning evil by laws. And that's what abortion is. It's evil enthroned by law. And so this is where we're at today. We have a broken covenant with God. We're reminded by the crack in the Liberty Bell. That God's holding this nation responsible for her actions. We've exported this curse to every nation on earth. They're having abortions, even in Israel. Not as much in Israel as here. But do you know, well, the church is complicit. Four out of ten women who get pregnant that attend church, four out of ten get abortions. That's 40%. Of women attending churches are getting abortions. Well it's a woman's right to choose. Don't we have a right to choose? Here's the problem. Those babies are protected by God. And by our constitution. It, you don't have the right to end their life. When God gave it. Amen. Well but it's inconvenient. Let's play that out, that out a bit for us. In New York recently, they passed another bill to have partial birth abortions, which means you can take it all the way down to the birth, and under certain circumstances, if, uh, if that baby, you know, it didn't work and the baby came out alive, you can still kill it. Okay, so let's extend that. It's a woman's right to choose. You get tired of being a mother. It's inconvenient. So you take your two-year-old toddler into the doctor's office, put him down. I can't handle being a mom anymore. Is that right to do? It's murder. It's murder in the womb, and it's murder outside the womb, anywhere along the line. That's a human being, and it's murder to take their lives. Why aren't we hearing this message preached? 
I'll tell you why. It's political pressure. I was in England in 2007. Now it's been, goodness, 10, 30, 14 years ago. And uh, they, were, they were debating these same issues and, and gay marriage and all that. And um, they said our, the, the greatest problem we're dealing with in England is political correctness. Nobody wants to speak out because they'll get canceled. Are we, do, are we hearing that today? They told me, they said, you know what, Pastor, in 10 years, you're going to see this in America. It's coming. And exactly what happened there 14 years ago is here now. Amen. Political correctness. And, they, and here's what I found out. <clears throat> I was the head of uh, Pray California at that time. And um, we had been contacted by England and asked to pray for them. And they said, what? What are you actually doing in California for prayer? I said, well, we, we believe that the best way to establish prayer is to serve each other and to get the different counties to pray for one another. So we, we have 58 counties. So in the course of the year, we are having each county pray for the other one on the condition they'll pray for the next one. So in serving one another, we're uniting the state in prayer because the counties, by the time we get done, they will be prayed for by each other. Oh, they said, that's great. Would you help us do that over here? In England and Wales combined, we have 53 counties. I said, well, yeah, we can help you, but why would you need us to help you? Because if you have the vision, can't you just go do that? And they said, yeah, but nobody will believe anything will happen. If somebody comes from the outside and walks with us, that'll make a difference. I said, okay, you send us a, a report uh, every week on one of your counties, and all of our counties will pray for your county. And uh, at the end of the year, they said, we want you to come over here. And so I, we prayed about it and talked about it. I said, okay, I want to meet with leaders in your nation and ask them, what are the three greatest needs that you have? And we sent out letters to people in high places. I met with the Queen's chaplain. I met with the Bishop of Rothschild, uh, Ross, uh, uh, Yorkshire and Rochester. And I was invited to the House of Commons and met with, with uh, Duncan Smith. I was invited to the House of Lords and met with Lord John Taylor, the first black man elected to the House of Lords. He's going to be connecting with us for what we're doing in Washington. And so when I asked him, tell me the three greatest needs you have in your nation, the number one thing they told me was political correctness is killing our nation. And I discovered this as I talked to them. These men who were in high places that were actually defending the family at that time, none of them were from England. God was exporting people from other nations. And so the Queen's chaplain was from India. The Bishop of um, York was from uh, Nigeria. The Bishop of Rod uh, Rochester is from India. These guys are all speaking up for family. But the people, the leadership from England, zip, say nothing. Politically won't be received. Here's the problem. We need pastors with a backbone. We need leadership in Congress that have moral integrity and fortitude that will stand up for this, the Word of God, and speak out for it. And we need to pray for that in the next election cycle, that either, either they will repent and turn their hearts towards God, or God will turn them out of office and bring people in who will stand up for Him. That's what's really needed in our nation, besides the church repenting and the seven mountains coming into their place. You know, the term for what we call church today uh, in the New Testament is ecclesia. And uh, people say, well, now wait, we got a separation between church and state. No, we don't. That's a lie. God never intended that. Now, he did intend that we would not prefer one group or one church over another because they got in trouble for that overseas. But um, there were godly men at that time in Congress. I remember Benjamin Franklin, they were arguing and couldn't agree on what would go into the Constitution. And so finally he got up and he said, gentlemen, I want to make a motion. The Bible tells us that not one sparrow will fall to the ground without God's notice. Is it probable that a nation can rise up out of nothing without God's help? I move that we adjourn men and we go pray. And they did. And when they came back, they were able to finish writing that world's greatest document. 
And then he said, I have another motion. That we will not open Congress on a daily basis without first having prayer from one of the local clergy. They still do that today. You know, they, they, they've made rules and laws about not having prayer in school, separation of church and state. It's all nonsense. They still pray in Congress. Why can't we pray at school? But Jesus is the enemy, not wanting to have. And now they've removed the Ten Commandments from the courts, and the courts are based on the Ten Commandments. It just doesn't make any sense. So we need a moral awakening in our nation. And, uh, and we're praying that that's going to happen. And so for those of you that are listening online, you haven't heard this. There is a National Day of Repentance Wednesday this coming week on December the 1st. Begins uh, actually the day before. And you can read about it, get all the details by, by going to um, nationaldayofrepentance.com or dot .net. Dot .com forward slash. .com forward slash. And uh, the, all of the details are there. But the court, the Supreme Court is meeting on the 1st to look at the heartbeat bill for Mississippi. And they're also waiting to make judgment on the heartbeat bill in Texas. This has the potential to turn back Roe versus Wade. So we're praying for a return to God in our nation. That somehow God will speak to the justices. There are enough there will have moral courage to do what is right. This is the, the first opportunity we've had in... in many many years to see this addressed in this way so we need to pray that God will actually move his hand in this regard but the church needs to pray so we're inviting all who hear about this to pray on that day fast and pray on this day on December the 1st Wednesday of this coming week and we invite you to join us in, in doing that and uh, we're, we're grateful for the opportunity my wife and I will be there uh, as a part of unrolling the scroll, uh, the Lincoln Memorial on the 29th, and uh, half a million signatures there with a moral outcry, and then different gatherings that have to do that day and the next day as the Supreme Court is meeting. And we're praying that God will return our nation. The year of Jubilee was about the return. Amen. People were called to return back to inheritance, back to covenant. They were essentially forgiven their debts, but not just their debts, they were forgiven. And they were called to come back and have their inheritance restored. When Christ stood up in the synagogue in Luke 418, they handed him the scroll of Isaiah, and he, he applied Isaiah 61. And it it goes on to say, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. That term there means afflicted. Good news to the afflicted, to heal the brokenhearted, set at liberty those who are bruised, set the captives free and open blind eyes, and to declare the favorable year of the Lord. That term, favorable year, is a reference to Jubilee. And what he was really saying is, from now on, every year will be a year of Jubilee, because I am your Jubilee. And in me you have your freedom and life. And me you can go free and have inheritance restored. Any day, any time, return to me. I'm here. Amen. They couldn't handle it. They wanted to shove him off a cliff and stone him. But that is our inheritance. That's the fulfillment of our Savior. Amen. And so on that basis, we can go into the courts of heaven. We can make our decrees and, and we can present our case. And we can pray and we can ask God to intervene. And we can declare to those who are lost to come in. You know, it, there is a parable that Christ told where there was a great wedding banquet that was being set up. And maybe I'll, what I'll do is for next week or tonight, I can do it. I'll print off uh, from my book, The Seven Lost Covenants of the Bible, the chapter on the Jubilee. But, it, but in that chapter, um, the Lord had me write about this parable that they wanted to furnish the master's banquet for the wedding and so all the invited guests had excuses they couldn't make and he said go out to the highways and byways and and find basically he said find the hurting and the broken Amen. find the lost and compel them to come in that there'll be enough guests at my feast 
And in the original language, it actually means find those who are riddled with pain. Invite them. And remember, they had to have on a wedding gown. The one guy that came in and didn't have on the wedding gown was thrown into outer darkness. The wedding gown is his righteousness. We're there not because we deserve to be. It's what a contrast. The, those who would be considered highly religious and saintly or whatever, they didn't come to the banquet. But those who were living out here under the bridge and the street and the alcoholic and the riddled with pain people, Bring them in. Those are the ones I want. I got a gown for them. I'm going to give them my righteousness. I'm going to qualify them to sit at my table. What a precious message of the gospel that we have. That because of the jubilee, because of the freedom and how it's fulfilled in Christ, we can go declare jubilee even to the wino that's out there under the bridge or the person that's homeless for whatever reason. And we could tell them you can have a new beginning, a new inheritance, and you can be seated at the master's table. Amen. That's why I'm delighted. You know, Reuben goes out and, and evangelizes on the street, and he brings people in. I'm delighted about that. Amen. If somebody comes in, they're hurting and in pain, let's just stop what we're doing and pray for them. Because it's not about the program. It's about declaring the Savior, yeah. His goodness, His love, His freedom, yeah. and His inheritance that every human being can have. And if we neglect that, what are we doing here? That's it. The church needs to wake up and examine its priorities. Because we, what we've done is we've made it all about the program. You know, we, we have these mega churches. 20,000 and it's all about the choir and the program. And, and, uh, but never a prophetic word is given. And, and in these seeker-friendly churches, they don't want to mention words like repentance or the blood. It might offend somebody. You know what? It's time to go back and preach what's in the book of Acts. Amen. Which is about the resurrection and repentance and returning to Him. Amen. This is the message that will save people's lives. Amen. So as we come to a conclusion today, um, we are some of us are going to be here tonight at 10 p.m. We're going to have an all-night prayer watch and praying for what's coming in, uh, on Wednesday, December 1st. And this is something we need to do more of because, you know, once a month or whatever. We have to hear God's heart. Amen. If you look at, if you bother to look at the, the book, and I can email you a, a copy of it. But if you look at the book, The Seven Lost Covenants of the Bible. Little King Josiah became a king at an early age. And... He heard that the temple was in disrepair and neglected. So he ordered, clean it up. Fix up my father's house. So as they were cleaning it up, they discovered the book of the covenant. They dusted it off. It was lost in the house. The covenants of God are lost in the house. We have more than a blood covenant. Amen. There is a salt covenant, sandal covenant, bridal covenant, jubilee covenant. There's seven covenants. And they're lost in the house. Amen. And so they came and brought it to him. And he was reading it. And he tore his robe and wept. And for that reason, God spared the kingdom as long as he was sitting on that throne. Yeah. God withheld the judgment. Because he repented. It's time for the house of God to repent. Amen. Rediscover our covenants with him. I'm going to do some, some maybe a series on these covenants. Because we need to periodically re revisit these Amen. they're powerful and, and here's what you find it's not just going back and looking at an old testament covenant if you apply them through the cross at calvary they take on a spiritual dimension that's powerful Amen. and so we apply that to today when we do that and we have that dimension of what it means to be with him and every one of them have to do about degrees of of intimacy with God and inheritance. They all do. And so the whole purpose of them. If you want to walk in the Jubilee anointing. Which is the anointing that's going to fuel the harvest. If you want to walk in that Jubilee anointing. You need to progressively apply the intimacy. In all those other covenants. Amen. The blood covenant. The salt friendship covenant. The sandal inheritance covenant. The bridal intimacy covenant. Um. Being in covenant with God as a royal priest. Jubilee covenant. 
all of these have something significant to say about preparing for the harvest. Amen. And so as a church, we rediscover um, all of these covenants that have to do with how can we walk in greater intimacy with God. We're going to see that God will give us more. Amen. The anointing will increase. And we'll have a sense of inheritance and destiny. So I think we're going to spend some time doing it. It's worth doing that. Amen. But uh, if you want a copy of that, I can e give you the e uh, the ebook. You can get it on Amazon. It's on Amazon. The Seven Lost Covenants of the Bible. Or I can send you an e-copy either way. Uh, I've been re-editing it a bit. So maybe I'll just do that. I'll just email it to you. Now let's ask God to bless us for this coming week. Amen. And, uh, and what's happening in our nation at this time. Father, we want to just thank you and give you praise today. That you are a covenant-keeping God. Man forgets, but you never forget. And those voices of the, of the blood that's been shed of those unborn babies, they're screaming in your ears. Lord, heal our tone deafness. Let us hear what you hear. Let what breaks your heart break our hearts. And Father, move us to pray your heart and to see this nation return to you. Yes. Lord God, we ask that you would reestablish your covenant with us that we started with as a nation. A jubilee covenant, how precious, that as applied to the cross, we can declare new inheritance and restoration to every lost person out there so they're prepared to sit at your table and your banquet. Amen. Thank you, Father, for using and blessing us today, we pray. In Christ Yeshua's name, amen. Amen, hallelujah.